Thanks so much for this opportunity to talk about my tapestries. I will be sharing some information about what tapestry is and a glimpse through a few of the series I have investigated throughout my career. This will be a bit of a hop, skip, and a jump, so if you want a fuller look at my work, you can wander over to my website, which will be listed at the end of the talk. I am going to start with a tour of my studio. Down here are some of the cotton yarns that I use in my tapestries. I use primarily wool, but I supplement it quite a bit with cotton and sometimes with some other yarns that I'll point out. This corner has some of the many pieces that I have woven that are based on fragments of textiles, details from garments or actual garments themselves. In some cases, the pieces, the tapestry itself is rectangular. And in some cases, like this blue checked slip, the piece is shaped. It's not a rectangle. It's a piece shaped, the, the shape of the slip mounted on a black mount. This is the piece that was accepted into the Southwest Regional Juried Exhibition. It's called Wander, and it's about 50 inches by 30 inches. Next to it is another piece about the same dimensions called Drift. This piece uses metallic yarns. Metallics are very shiny, which is nice because they contrast with wool, which tends to absorb a lot of light, so is not shiny. The metallics are also sort of unruly. They, they want to do what they stick out here and there, and I kind of decided in this piece to just let them do that. Not too much, but a little. Over here is a collection of pieces, all smaller format, and they were all done within the last year and a half. And all of the designs are based on images that were developed in Photoshop. I'm going to be talking more about my design methods for these pieces and the larger pieces a little bit later. Over here are some storage shelves. Artists always need a lot of stuff in order to make things. This is my primary wool stash. This yarn is no longer made, but I have quite a bit of it. So that's good. Down here is a drawing by Georgia Munger, in case any of you knew her. I am also an art historian, and so I have a lot of books. This is my computer, and as you will discover, it's important my, in my art making because as I mentioned, I designed some of my pieces in Photoshop. This is a detail from a tapestry that I'm currently working on, and we'll take a look at the loom a little bit later. This is my drawing table. Most of my designing on paper is done with pencil, graphite, and colored pencil. I like to work on graph paper. I draw right on graph paper or I put white paper over this graph paper base that I've made, and then I can see the grid below the white paper. I use a lot of pattern in my work, and having a grid is uh, a handy tool. Here's some of that unruly metallic yarn. This is both silver and gold thread. As you can see, it, it's kind of a wild thing to work with. In the back is my loom. The loom is a basically a big frame that you weave tapestries on. This is a four foot loom, which means that one dimension of the piece is restricted to the width of 48 inches, but the other dimension can be unlimited pretty much. And that is because the loom has roller beams. So you start the tapestry as you move up, you roll it down onto this beam, weave some more, roll it down, 
move some more, etc. This is a smaller loom that I weave smaller tapestries on and I also color sample on. These are the color samples for the current tapestry. I always color sample before I start. These are the colors, the wool weft colors that I'm using in the current tapestry. And here is the piece in progress. The cotton warp is stretching up vertically and the wool weft is packed down so that it completely covers the warp. These are bobbins. For me, bobbins are an essential tool. Each pass of weft of the colored yarn can have multiple threads. And in this case, you can see that I have blends of, that include both lighter value and darker value greens. Those threads are wound together on this bobbin. And then the point of the bobbin is used to beat the piece in place. I'm going to be talking a little bit more about process as well. What is tapestry anyway? Tapestry is a form of weaving, the interlacement of two sets of threads called the warp and the weft. The warp threads are the vertical threads in the diagram and the weft threads are the horizontal threads. The interlacement pattern is under, over, under, over, which is known as plain weave. Some of you may have woven a potholder on a frame loom during summer camp. That would have been plain weave, but not necessarily tapestry weave. In tapestry weave, the size and spacing of the warp and weft are calculated so that the weft packs down to completely cover the warp. This is referred to as weft face. You can see this in the bottom diagram and in the photo of a tapestry in progress where the colored wefts pack tightly to cover the white warp. In addition, each weft color weaves only in the areas where it is needed. It does not travel from one side of the fabric to the other. This is referred to as discontinuous weft. In the photo on the right, the red travels back and forth, under, over, under, over, just within the shape that is red. Colors build shapes and other colors fill in around those shapes. Tapestry is usually defined as weft faced plain weave with discontinuous wefts. Although, as with any definition, there are those who would beg to differ. Tapestry is woven on a loom. Tapestry looms are essentially frames, small or large, that can withstand a lot of pressure without breaking or twisting. The warp threads are strung on the frame under great tension. Tapestry weaving is slow, as you can see in this video. Each pass through the warp includes just a small handful of warp threads. The tapestry is built one row at a time. The weft is wound around a bobbin and the point of the bobbin beats the weft down so that it completely covers the warp. Not long after I started weaving tapestry, I took a class from Ruth Tannenbaum a founding member of the San Francisco Tapestry Workshop. In addition to her training in San Francisco, Ruth had studied in Paris at the Gobelin, the French government's tapestry manufactory. When I met Ruth, she was preparing to open a tapestry studio in New York City, and she asked me if I would like to be part of it. I said yes and made the move in the summer of 1982. When I moved to New York, I undertook a nine-month apprenticeship the style of tapestry weaving was based on the techniques developed in medieval Europe and now usually associated with historical French and Flemish tapestry. I have, for the most part, remained loyal to these techniques, although as my study of different tapestry weaving traditions progressed, other tapestry traditions and their associated techniques have become an important influence on my approach to tapestry and my designs. In 1987, I moved to Maine, 
and began exploring what my life as a tapestry weaver would be after my work at the studio in New York. I wove several projects for schools and government office buildings through the Maine Percent for Art program and was fortunate to receive corporate commissions during this time. I continued to teach at schools and art guilds throughout the country, including a position at the University of Maine at Orono. I also wove many speculative works for exhibition. One influence on my work is pattern. Pattern is common in textiles. It can be used as an abstract decorative component as seen in the geometric elements in these two tapestries. It can also be used to create more representational images. The anthropomorphic form and feline figure in this Andean tapestry are built from rectangles, triangles, and other geometric forms. Tapestry itself is a grid structure, the vertical warp threads intersecting with the horizontal weft threads. Tapestries whose imagery is built from geometric forms mirrors the structure of the weaving itself. The style of the imagery in this Norwegian tapestry is more naturalistic, but geometric patterns still dominate. Each part of the image is constructed from stripes, squares, rectangles, and triangles. I have employed pattern in my own work, either by using images that are somewhat pattern-based in and of themselves, as with the roof tiles in Stopping By, and or by constructing an image with repeated images and motifs. This is another tapestry woven during the time I lived in Maine. I'm going to talk a little bit about my design process as I show images of my work. Most tapestries start with a design that is at least partly conceived in some other medium. Drawings, paintings, collage, and photographs can all serve as a way for the artist to pre-visualize the image that will eventually be woven. The image in a tapestry is created through the weaving process. It is not sewn or printed onto an existing substrate. The cloth and the image are one and the same thing. Any corrections or changes are made by unweaving and then reweaving. Because of this, most tapestry artists choose to work from a fairly well worked out design or maquette. That said, one of the qualities that most tapestry artists strive for in their work is a balance between the maquette and the weaving. Most people feel that slavishly copying a drawing or painting does not allow tapestry's unique qualities to speak. Tapestry has its own material and technical language of color, density, weight, texture, and the various woven techniques that are used to build images and blend colors. All of these can be exploited to enhance both the content and the form of the image. For the tapestry rags and tatters, the drawing of the fence post and the cloth hanging from barbed wire are repeated three and four times respectively in the completed design, which was worked out at full scale as I drew the cartoon. What I am thinking of at this point in the design process is the composition, the placement of the various components in the image and the path that the viewer's eye will take through the image. I am also thinking about color. I sample colors on a frame loom. In general, I work with a fairly limited color palette and I strive for a particular balance between those colors. Sampling before I start weaving saves time. This is the completed tapestry. Because the image in tapestry arises as the fabric itself is woven, the concept of negative space does not have the same meaning as it does in, for example, a drawing in which the blank paper is a given. In tapestry, it takes just as long to weave the negative space as it does to weave the objects in the field of the design, the positive space. This reality has resulted in a strong tradition of textile designs that balance the positive and negative and has been seen as an influence for some tapestry weavers, including me. I keep the interplay between positive and negative space in mind as I create my designs. Here are two small tapestries using nested patterns and interacting positive and negative space. Many of these considerations concerning what essential nature, if any, tapestry weaving has, led me to weave images of cloth. 
my love of the old techniques that were used in the drapery of medieval European tapestry, my interest in pattern, and the self-referential aspect inherent in creating a weaving of a weaving all made this subject matter compelling to me. Many of my weavings of cloth or clothing are shaped tapestries, as are these. In other words, the tapestry is not a rectangle. It, it is the shape of the cloth. Here are two small shaped weavings of garments. In addition to my career as a weaver, I have also taught extensively and worked in arts administration, notably as the executive director of the American Tapestry Alliance. I retired in the summer of 2019, which freed up a lot of time to get back into my studio to explore new directions. Not long after, we were visited by a pandemic and I found myself in my studio most days. Despite all of the anxieties and inconveniences of COVID-19, for me, this last year has been a very productive exploration in new directions. The work I will show now, all completed in the last year and a half, is based on designs created with Photoshop. Simply put, I create collages using materials from a variety of sources, drawings, photographs, historic textiles, and more. The images interact with each other, overlapping, bleeding in and out of each other, and sometimes standing as independent units within the design. I'll explain my process as I show you the work. The design for Reconsider 3 incorporates details from two Andean textiles, a band with a repeated bird motif on the far right, and a geometric design in the middle. The two images are combined in Photoshop. The textile with the bird motif sits on top of the geometric pattern tapestry. It is set to bleed through in the darker values so that the geometric pattern tapestry shows through in the darker areas of the bird motif tapestry. My goal is that the individual components in the design are recognizable, but that the ways in which I combine them create something new. Boundless consists of two separate tapestries mounted together. I wove the top piece first, and after taking a workshop called Mining Historic Textiles, perfect for me, I began adding additional components to my designs that would extend, complicate, or perhaps even trouble the image and its possible meanings. For Boundless, that involved thinking about the nature of repeat patterning and how engrossing it can be, especially when the repeat is not exact. Repeat patterns with quote-unquote mistakes is a design skill that Andean weavers perfected. The word boundless arose in my mind in conjunction with thinking about both the possible never-ending nature of a repeat pattern and also the more cosmic or universal implications of something that continues into infinity. I wove the word fading into the background and running off the page as a separate tapestry and mounted the two together. The source images for Boundless are a stepped triangle pattern from a Nazca discontinuous warp and weft fabric on the far left, and a double-headed serpent motif from an Andean double weave in the middle. In Photoshop, the Nazca textile sits on top of the double-headed serpent. The serpent bleeds through in specific value ranges of the Nazca textile. I am going to dive a little deeper into the design process as I discuss Wander, explaining, hopefully somewhat clearly, how the image is built in Photoshop. This slide shows the different layers of the image and how they interact. Level 1 on the left is the background layer. It is a dark gray. Level 2 sits on top of level 1. It has three components. On the top is a detail from an Andean fragment depicting brocket deer. Below the deer is a pattern I created by taking a detail from a Berber carpet, altering its proportions, and repeating it. The original carpet detail is below on top, and below that is the stretched detail. In the complete design, there are five repeats of the stretched carpet detail. You might be able to make them out in the image of all the parts of level two. The bottom section of level two is a detail from the rocks in level three. Level three sits on top of the brocket deer in level two. It is a detail from a photograph of a rock wall that has been modified in Photoshop with the cutout filter. The original detail from the photograph is below. 
the rock layer is set so that it bleeds through in the darker values, revealing the brocket deer in the cracks between the rocks. Level 4 is a collage of two different drawings of birds that are repeated at different angles. Level 5 are the words wander. The text is set to dissolve into the layer beneath it, which is the Berber carpet detail and a little bit of the two sections of rock wall. The image on the far right is the final cartoon with all of the levels of the image stacked on top of each other. And here is the tapestry again. I'll explain the process for this tapestry, Drift, as well. This slide shows the various components that went into the design for Drift and the final design on the right. Some components I chose for their color, some for their pattern. Layer 1 is a detail from a blue fabric that I repeated four times to create the rectangular shape of the design. Layers 2 and 3 are repeats from details taken from historical textiles. The details that I used for the repeats are above. Layer 4 is two red stripes. Layer 5 includes the gold motif that is above it, repeated up the length of the tapestry, getting increasingly smaller as it progresses up. Layers 2 through 5 sit on top of layer 1. There is no bleeding through these layers. Layer 6 is a schematic for a twill weave pattern that I created and then erased parts of so that it was not completely a regular pattern. That layer accounts for the darker areas in the blue. This layer does bleed into the blue so that it is less apparent. Drift also employs two weave densities. In the coarser areas I used boucle yarns for texture. The middle section is finer and uses metallic yarns. You might be able to discern these material differences in the detail images on the right. Graffiti 1 combines a detail from an Andean textile which has been duplicated three times, a photograph of rocks that has had a Photoshop filter applied to it, and a blue textile. On the far right is the tapestry. It is woven with two different densities. The coarser areas are blue. They employ cotton and metallic yarns that contrast materially with the finer sections using wool. Span combines a detail from an Aymara poncho with a pattern I created by taking motifs from different textiles and constructing my own pattern. Building my own patterns from small details of textiles is a direction I have been exploring more recently. Thank you for your interest in my work and the field of contemporary tapestry. Please visit my website and if you have any questions, feel free to email me.